In the previous episode, I said a few things off the cuff that weren't quite correct. Somehow, despite making about 10 different takes of the what makes it tick segment, I still managed to blow it. I said we'd be working with the 8510. In fact, the 8510 doesn't exist. Somehow, I managed to get 8502 and 6510 swapped in my head. The actual CPU we'll be working with is the 8502. I also misspoke and said that the 8502's ALU could do multiplication and division. In reality, it doesn't have a floating point unit, so we can't do hardware assisted multiplication or division. The best we can do is binary shifts or successive addition and subtractions. What's interesting about this is that the 128's basic is a floating point version instead of an integer basic. This means that math operations in basic are significantly slower if you're not careful about the data types you use. And finally, I somehow managed to swap the high and the low bytes of the program counter in my whiteboard diagram. PCH is responsible for the most significant bits of the address lines, instead of bits A0 through A7. Okay, that out of the way, let's get into the main video chip in the 128, the VIC-2. The VIC-2 is a little different from the 8502 we covered before. This chip has 14 address lines, which allows it to access a maximum of 16 kilobytes of addressable RAM. In terms of video capabilities, the VIC-2 supports 8 hardware sprites, 16 colors, and a 320 by 200 high resolution display which allows us 2 colors per 8x8 character. Additionally, this video mode can be downscaled to 160 by 200 to allow for 4 colors per 8x8 character. Using a similar technique, the sprites can also be downscaled to support 4 colors per sprite instead of the usual 2. Finally, the VIC-2 can provide a text screen of 40 by 20 characters, which is what we'll be mostly using in this series. In terms of computer architecture, we actually have four major players, the 8502, an MMU, the VIC-2, and 128 kilobytes of RAM. The address lines of the 8502 are actually not connected directly to the DRAM. Instead, they're connected to the MMU. The MMU's translated address lines are then shared by the VIC-2 and connected to the DRAM. The data lines, on the other hand, are both directly connected to RAM without interference from the MMU. Effectively, this means that the MMU can redirect the 8502 to any other page of RAM for a given address. To prevent bus contention, the VIC-2 has both a latch and a MUX to control access between the MMU and the VIC. Now the diagrams I drew are simplified to cover just the VIC-2 and its interaction with the CPU. I've intentionally left out quite a bit of detail in the interconnects to keep things simple in the beginning. There's a ton of detail in the manuals, and since most of it was taken from Bill Hurd's engineering notes, it can be very confusing, even if you're used to reading data from sheets from component vendors. In fact, it confused me so much that I had to delay this video. If you'd like to dig into the actual 128 architecture diagram, there's a detailed sketch in Chapter 16 of the Commodore 128 Programmer's Reference Manual. I'll have a link to the manual on archive.org in the description of this video. Now that we've covered the layout of the VIC and the CPU, let's put some more of this into practice. According to the Programmer's Reference Manual, the default location for the VIC's color RAM starts at D800 hex. So let's modify our screen clearing program to cycle through the character set and also cycle through all 16 foreground colors available to us. So here's our screen clearing program that we had in episode 1. Should be pretty familiar. First we load X and Y with zeros. Next we transfer Y to A. And finally we store A to the character memory using X as the offset. Now here's where the fun part comes in. We store the value in A to the color RAM, also offset by X. Now the color RAM starts at D800 hex and spans four pages, which is why we have four store instructions. Next, we increment X and we branch back to the store instructions until X has rolled over to zero. Finally, we also increment Y and branch back to 1804 where we repeat the transfer. From there, the inner loop using X takes over, with the whole process repeating itself until Y rolls over to zero. Okay, so now that we've got our program entered, let's give it a shot. Where are the colors? 
It didn't show the colors. Let's try that again. Okay, so let's go back to the whiteboard for a moment. We know that the VIX 40 by 20 text screen is between 400 and 700 hex. What we didn't know is that this doesn't extend through the whole page. Starting at 7E8 are the VIX default sprite definition pointers. Since we aren't using sprites just yet, overriding this area isn't causing us trouble, but it's good to know about for the future. Far below this area, starting at D800 hex, is the VIX color RAM. This area is special. The same address space is shared between additional I.O. registers and the VIX color RAM. Let's step back a bit and go higher level. The 128 kilobyte DRAM is divided into two 64 kilobyte chunks, block 0 and block 1. The 6502 has enough address lines to access only one of these chunks at a time. Unfortunately, we also have to overlay each one of our ROMs and I.O. registers into the same address space. Now this is where the MMU comes in. It allows for fine-grained control over what chunks of address space are mapped by various peripherals, RAM, and ROM. Fortunately, Commodore sets up four default mappings, or banks, that can take care of most of the hard work. We just have to choose the right ones. Banks 0 and 1 are mappings of whole RAM blocks, save for the common areas, which contains our stack, zero page, and MMU registers. Note that this includes the area between 0 and 400. Banks 14 and 15 are combinations of RAM, ROM, and the I.O. space I mentioned before. Starting at FF100 and E1000 is the kernel ROM, followed by the character ROM in Bank 14 between E1000 and D1000. Bank 15 differs from 14 in this area by including three separate things in the same space. Between E1000 and D800 is a block of I.O. registers, followed by the color RAM we tried to change earlier. And finally, more I.O. registers. To finish out Bank 15, we have the Screen Editor ROM, Monitor ROM, Basic ROM, and finally a chunk of Block Zero RAM. Bank 14 is effectively the same as 15 outside of the E1000 to D1000 range. Bear in mind, these banks can be freely switched between at any time during a program's execution. Okay, so going back to the monitor, we should take a look at the address column again. If you remember, the program counter can only store 16 bits for the address, but this address column shows more than that. These last two bytes of the number are the address in the memory. This leading nibble, however, is the current bank that the MMU is configured with. Because we haven't been specifying the leading nibble, the monitor just assumes zero. Since we want to change the color RAM, we need to set this to 15, or F in hex. Otherwise, we'll get the same results as before. Just remember, we'll figure it out. Okay, so let's give this a try. Let's prefix the address we jump to with an F to set the MMU and see what happens. Yes. That about wraps up this partial intro to the VIX-2. For the next video, for real this time, I'm going to dive into the VIX hardware sprites. These are at least as complicated as the memory layout is, and will be a key function of the game that I end up writing. In the meantime, I highly recommend using the Vice X128 emulator to mess around with the built-in machine language monitor. You can also use it to follow along with some of the programming I do on this channel, too. Also, Give the two books I've linked in the description a look through, as they'll help to fill in the gaps and are worth their weight in gold. Thanks again, and catch you later!